Today, I have the great honor of introducing Mr. Trevor Potter, who is a Brooks graduate. Mr. Potter has far too many achievements to mention in his introduction, but he was described by the American Bar Association Journal as hands down one of the top lawyers in the country on the delicate intersection of politics, law, and money. He founded the Campaign Legal Center, an organization dedicated to advancing democracy through law at the federal, state, and local levels, fighting for every American's right to responsive government and a fair opportunity to participate in and affect the democratic process. Mr. Potter was a former chairman of the Federal Election Committee and has had recurring appearances on the Colbert Report. He has provided testimony and written statements to Congress on federal election proposals, campaign finance regulation, and recently, the effects of the January 6th attack on our democracy. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Potter back to chapel. Thank you, Drake, very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back here and in the Ashburn Chapel. I think looking around, I am probably the only person here who actually knew Mr. Ashburn. Uh, so I feel a little bit a bridge from the past. Uh, I arrived at Brooks in 1969. The school was only 42 years old. So when I left, uh, we were thinking about celebrating the school's 50th anniversary. Now you all are thinking about celebrating the school's 100th. Uh, it was a great privilege to know Mr. Ashburn. Um, I was actually his last senior prefect. Uh, he was a man of great integrity. Uh, he founded Brooks after a golden career at Groton and Yale. He could have gone on to be a great success in law or business, as many of his classmates were, but he followed his calling to education, to found a new school. He knew what he wanted to teach and how he wanted to teach and how he wanted his school to live. The story I have always been most impressed by about Mr. Ashburn was early in his career at Brooks, um, and it was a disagreement he had with Endicott Peabody who was the head of Groton School, the founder of Groton. He was on the Brooks board. He was Mr. Ashburn's mentor. And he was an Episcopal minister. And Mr. Ashburn left here, went to Groton to see the Peabody's and spend the night. And over dinner, Mr. Peabody said, so now that Brooks is up and going, it is time for you to leave for a while, go to seminary, and become an Episcopal minister. It's important for the school to have a minister as its head. And Mr. Ashburn said, no, that's not for me. I don't want to do that. I think it could interfere with my relationships with the students. And Endicott Peabody said to him, well, then you can't remain as headmaster. So Mr. Ashburn went to bed in the Peabody's house thinking that he was going to have to leave the school he had just founded rather than do something he thought was wrong for him and wrong for the school. At breakfast the next morning, he came down and Mrs. Peabody was at the table alone and she said to him, Frank, you can forget all that conversation of last night. I talked to Endicott and you can ignore what he said. So that was a happy ending for Mr. Ashburn and for Brooks, but a window into the integrity of that man. My own relationship with Mr. Ashburn and Brooks was not easy from the start. I was admitted to Brooks as what was then called a underachiever. I showed signs of having a brain, but no sign that I knew how to use it. My SSAT score in English was 99, the, the top score, 
And in math, I think it was either a one or a two. My last grades from Chicago Latin School were four Fs and a D. Alarmed, Mr. Ashburn told my parents that I needed to go to St. George's Summer School before I got here. I did. St. George's had a lovely beach, but I don't think I learned very much that summer. It took me a while to get on my feet academically at Brooks. I loved English and history and social studies. I read voraciously as I always had. But I was an undisciplined learner. I had never learned how to study and had a short attention span. I read what I liked, not what I was supposed to. Brooks slowly taught me that I could succeed in class. It made me think about what I was reading and what that meant. I vividly recall turning in an English paper and it came back with a big, this is BS in red ink at the top. He may not have used the initials. I was shocked. I was not used to being engaged that way by a teacher. But he was right, of course. I had written a word salad because I had not thought about what I wanted to actually say and communicate. At Brooks, I gradually learned that writing was about expressing thoughts which required thinking. A bell went off. So the student I was when I arrived at 13 was not the person I was at 25 after Brooks College and Law School. That is, after all, the point of education. But Brooks got me started down that path. I tell you of my early failures not to glorify daydreaming in class or only studying when you like the subject but to say to those of you who are still finding your way that there is still time. One lesson I did learn was that I do better when I am engaged in work that I care about. It energizes me and makes me dig in more deeply. When I was a young lawyer at a Washington law firm, I was asked to go work in the government contracts practice. They had a new partner, he needed help. I was told there was a great future. I spent a week in the library reading government contracts, texts and cases, staring blankly. It might as well have been Greek to me. I realized it just was of no interest. Then I was offered an opportunity to work in the field of election law. I knew I loved it from the first day I started. It was about politics. It was about clients, candidates with problems. It was relevant to elections and public policy. It had history and practical work all intertwined with constitutional theory. I had found my career. What I took from Brooks was the example of people with integrity. Mr. Ashburn and others, who cared about teaching and doing the right thing. In politics, I found that same thing working with Senator John McCain, a former prisoner of war, a heroic figure who had survived torture and come home to serve in the House of Representatives and the Senate from Arizona. I was his lawyer for his 2000 and 2008 presidential campaigns. John McCain loved his country. His campaign motto was country first, meaning over political party or personal political success. He was not perfect. He struggled to succeed in a political world which required compromise. But he had integrity. In the end, he made the right choices. In his 2008 presidential campaign against Barack Obama, the first black major party nominee, 
he was always being pushed by staff and supporters to play the race card, to subtly attack Obama for his race and background. He refused to do so. He said, I don't want to win that way. When a questioner at a public town hall said to McCain that she was worried because Obama was a danger to the country, a closet Muslim from a foreign background, McCain contradicted her. He said, no ma'am, I disagree with him on policy, but he is a good American and he shares the same love of this country that I do. John McCain very badly wanted to be president and thought he'd be a good one, but he was not going to sacrifice his principles and values to get there. That was the integrity that attracted me to him. Today, I have the privilege of working for integrity in our elections, that they should be fairly and transparently run, that every citizen should be able to vote and have their vote counted, that politicians should not be able to rig the system and prevent supporters of the other party from voting, that citizens should be able to trust the election system and its results. My work in this area is a privilege and it is built on a foundation that goes back to my years at Brooks and the teaching and examples of integrity that I learned here and from people I have worked with afterwards. For that, I am everlastingly grateful. And it is a privilege to be at Brooks today with all of you. Thank you.